Welcome and thanks for coming. I actually, um, I'm delighted to actually go first because then I can like pay attention to all the rest of the um, speakers and I really enjoy this day and we, we try to make this program fresh every year so you'll see that our agenda and our curriculum changes hopefully with the times. In fact, <laughs> in fact, you know, we want it to be like um, a fresh curriculum because really what we want it to do is like inform you to help you with the things that are, you know, coming available with information during the year because as a busy clinician, I know what it's like to like keep up with the literature and like, you know, get into a more in-depth thing when you're so busy. And so if you have comments or what things, topics that you think that we haven't covered, please feel free to email us and let us know because we want to make it the most user-adapted conference that you can spend your Saturday on, even in December, which is a really busy time of the year. Okay, so that kind of speech leads to why I picked this topic for the day, which is menopause and menopause. And I know it's a silly kind of a title, and I did it on purpose. But here's the reason. I've seen a rash of male patients in the clinic, and I see a lot of clinic patients, both men and women, because although I'm the woman's expert, so-so, um, the women are bringing their husbands and their boyfriends and their fathers, and men pick women too. So, um, But I've seen a rash of male patients who've been put on testosterone who had a lot of complications. I had um, patients of mine that had gone to see, you know, these low T clinics and put on testosterone and otherwise you would have been like no way you can't take the testosterone I had one seminal patient where he had literally occluded his iliac veins both all the way down to the popliteals on testosterone okay so I thought to myself oh my gosh why is no one covering this thing and then in fact there was a big New York Times op-ed in 2014 where there had been a study that was released and somebody a doctor, a urologist, had written this beautiful op-ed piece about low T and overtreatment, and I thought, oh my gosh, you know, maybe the whole story about women and heart disease is replaying itself in the male world because of a lot of pharmaceutical um, sponsored stuff. So what we're going to do today is we're going to briefly review the data for women and talk about the data for men because, as I said, I think it's a story that's perpetuating itself. And we haven't done women in heart disease for hormones in a while, and there's been like some um, new developments from some um, big players in the field. Okay, so that's what we have. So I was going to start out with, for women in heart disease, we're actually doing really well, okay? Um, you can see that the trends for both men and women since um, really 2000, the statistics for mortality have dropped like a real rock, okay? And I love this slide because it shows that it's working, whatever we're doing for prevention and for better treatment of people with vascular disease, it's working well in both men and women. And yes, we may be putting ourselves out of business by reducing the event rates and reducing the death rates and the bypass rates and the stent rates and hopefully the transplant um, requirements, but we will never reduce the number of transplants we do because there are so many more patients that need a transplant than can get them. So Deborah Myers, you're safe for the future in your job. Okay, um, the rest of us have some difficulties. So risk factors have changed, but the truth is is that, yes, biological risk factors, hypertension, tobacco use, and um, family history um, haven't really changed that much, right? Metabolic risk factors at baseline haven't changed, but how we take care of those metabolic risk factors have changed dramatically. And I would submit to you that one of the main reasons that we have this decline in mortality over the last 16 years is because more people take cholesterol drugs, okay? Um, we have the same level of patients that have hypertension, probably even more as people become more obese. There's more diabetes, there's more insulin resistance, um, there's more sedentary activity, and yet the disease rates are do of death are gone down dramatically, um, most likely because we're better twofold, um, better able to prevent disease by the good care that we're providing to our patients. And half of the benefit is also from what we do in buildings like this where we take better care of the patients once they become ill. So the techniques and the streamlined approach to how we care for people have improved outcomes. 
So statin use is up dramatically since 2000. You can see that age over 65, um, it's gone to nearly 40% um, um, in females, about a third. And even in that age group, 45 to 65, that middle age group, um, rates are increased really from very low rates in 2000 to widely accepted, 16 to 13 to 16%. Um, people think that if you look at risk factors by obesity, um, if you look at how people live near the poverty level, the obesity statistics, this is actually interesting, is that people that are below the poverty level are not getting any bigger. They don't have any excess money to get any more bad food. Actually, the obesity rates are increasing at one to two times the poverty level because then there's a little bit extra money and then people adopt that, you know, kind of really bad American diet in that age group. And so those obesity levels have increased. So what about menopause? So menopause, um, really, honestly, women are at low risk for heart disease before menopause. So in fact, if you call and you say, I'm having chest discomfort, or can you see the patient, I'm going to ask how old they are, and I'm going to be thinking, you know, are they perimenopausal? Have they had early menopause? As a way of measuring what their innate cardiac risk is for, you know, how quickly do you need to assess the patients? What about menopause increases the risk? And we know that menopause or menopausal women have a two to four fold elevated risk of heart disease. And menopause interacts with all the other risk factors for heart disease. It increases the weight, makes women a little bit more sedentary, it raises the blood pressure, it raises the glucose, and the LDL, le LDL cholesterol levels increase. HDL levels tend to reduce a little bit over um, this period. And so all these things elevate a woman's risk for developing heart disease. It is thought that the menopausal or, you know, the menop before you go through menopause, a woman is relatively protected from developing vascular disease. And that may be the reason why women develop heart disease full fold 10 years after men, okay? So if you look at that ASCVD score, risk calculator score. And I'm going to ask, how many people out there are using the risk calculator scores? It's catching on. It's a little cumbersome when you see the patient because you don't always have the laboratory when you see the patient. I find that to be one of the stumbling blocks. So what I tend to do if I've seen the patients before is we will calculate what their ASCVD score is based on this year's weight, I mean this year's age, this year's, you know, blood pressure, you know, and then use last year's cholesterol. But I will say, okay, this is the nuance of working in the field, is that you don't know what to do about the lipids when they're at that perimenopausal period because the, the lipids really are changing. If a woman is, you know, five or ten years from menopause, their lipids, if they're not on drugs, their lipids are pretty stable after menopause. And I find that the that's maybe a good paper. Um, the ASCVD scores don't really change that much. But it's something I think that it's a little cumbersome. I find it effective. And I think that the patients like the information about is that you're just not like willy nilly just deciding, you know, without any data. They can look it up themselves. And I sometimes give them, you know, the website. And I, I sometimes actually print out, if the printer's working, that's connected to my computer in the office. I print out what their ASCVD score is so that they can take it home and I encourage them to play with the score like, you know, if your blood pressure were better, it would be better. If your LDL were lower, you would have a lower score. So I find that helpful. Okay, so let's go to women and heart disease and look at hormone trials. So I lived through this era and I worked at the Brigham where Joanne Manson was um, 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 a researcher for the um, Women's Health Initiative and um, I was around the people that were studying this and so uh, during my fellowship and formative years I mean we really thought hormones were really good for you and here's the reason why all the observational studies looking at women pre hormone and after hormone or comparing hormone use that hormones when given to women in the postmenopausal period 
had a lower relative risk of heart disease. So these studies, you can see the blue dots are for estrogen replacement therapy and the yellow dots are for hormone or estrogen plus progesterone therapy. Um, showed you know, a, a pretty substantial um, effect on outcome for heart disease. The caveat, and this is what you have to understand, is when you look at these natural, I mean, um, observational studies, women that, got hor women that take or are willing or eager to take hormones, take hormones when they go through menopause, right? Because there's no reason to take, the main reason that you'd want to take hormones is if you have symptoms of menopause. So if you're far out from menopause, you've probably survived and you're not having that much symptoms long term. So these studies are of women that started hormone when they went through menopause, right at probably the age of 50, 51, 52, which is the average median age for um, um, menopause in our society. So the observational studies are different than the treatment trials for um, hormones. The thought was, why are hormones good for you? And the, one of the biological mechanisms is that estrogen encourages um, LDL to come down, okay? It brings up the triglycerides, it raises the HDL a little bit, but the thought was that by reducing LDL cholesterol, it was having some beneficial effect in the um, vasculature. So the nurses um, health study, many nurses here participated, actually my nurse MC is still in the nurses health study, which I think is so cute. Um, was a primary prevention study of coronary disease. It looked at healthy postmenopausal women, and it had a huge number, 28,000 nurses, which were kind of eager um, to participate in the study because the nurses health study followed the very famous physician's health study um, by a few years, um, which came out with some very important findings and um, changes in the management of primary prevention. It's the study for which we demonstrated that aspirin was beneficial for um, heart um, patient or for primary prevention of heart disease in um, U.S. and British physicians after the age of 65. But in the nurses' health study, they looked at it was a non-randomized just survey questionnaire that was mailed out. They looked at current users of hormone and compared them to never users, and they found that there was, in fact, a 40% reduction in, in um, coronary or car, um, arterial vascular risk um, compared to the non-users, and a 50% reduction in all-cause mortality. They found that there was a loss of benefit after five years when the hormones were stopped and that those that had a natural menopause benefited more than those who had a surgical menopause. So so here's the data when they looked at it, that 28,000, and they looked at them over a longer period of time where they enrolled more nurses. So in the end, they had 70,000 nurses. And there was, and this is actually an important study because it shows that if, I love the study because it's going to show something important that's going to be helpful when we look at the male data. We're going to look at stroke and heart disease deaths. And compared to never users, and this is dose de dependent risk, is that over a, a Premarin dose of 0.625, there was certainly an increased risk of stroke. There was a protective, thought to be a protective effort um, by the hormones to prevent heart disease. Um, and um, this led the way to the... Um, HERS trial, which was a secondary prevention trial. Now, I was involved in clinical trials in this period, and really what they did in this trial was they took a, like a treatment trial for heart disease, much like they would have done for cholesterol drug treatment. So you take a population that you think is at risk, that's older, because really what is, if you're going to fund a study, you want to have the smallest number of people followed by the smallest amount of time because it costs less money, right? So they ran these trials for secondary prevention for hormone, much like they ran the cholesterol drug treatment trials. They took a population of women that were older, that had already gone through menopause and had been off hormone for at least a decade, okay? So they took a riskier population of women and they randomized them to estrogen, 
or progesterone or with progesterone in two groups. So there was HERS-1 and HERS-2, but long story, they, they had an average age of 67. So it was older women and they looked at a four-year follow-up and then the HERS-2 trial was like a registry after the HERS-1 where they followed women even longer for 6.8 years and they had a hard end point. So they looked at CV death and MI and here's what they showed. They showed really that the hormones really didn't make that much of a difference, but there was a little bit of an excess risk in that first four years for more women in the group that got the hormones had more heart attacks and more deaths, and the study was stopped early, okay? Because it was clearly not going to show benefit, okay? And even followed long term, which was a beautiful thing that they did because a lot of people would have said, well, maybe you didn't treat them long enough. So they enrolled and kept following the patients half of them for another you know 2.8 years and still no benefit so this really was a wake-up call and I remember it was like 2002 um, it changed how we practice so if you looked at the data for venous thromboembolism or PE in the HERS trial clearly there was excess risk of venous thromboembolism excess risk in the first year the second year the third year the fourth year all the years, excess venothrombus, um, venovascular disease. So clearly a risk factor for um, DVT and PE. So then that led to the Women's Health Initiative, the WHI, which was the first primary prevention randomized trial. Okay? But again, okay, so this becomes a little bit more complicated. Again, they enrolled women at average age 63. So why did they wait? Okay, so the other rule about clinical trials is you want to run the trial as economically conservatively as you can, but you also don't want patients dropping out of your trial early because of side effects. So what they didn't want is people that were seriously symptomatic from vasomotor symptoms that got randomized to placebo to drop out of the trial and cross over to your active treatment, okay? And they also didn't want women to bleed. So they, they started the trial in older postmenopausal women, average age 63. Again, you know, 10 years after the menopause. So nothing like the natural observational trials where women were started in the 50s. Does that make sense? Different kind of populations. So this was actually quite important, actually, as a trial. Um, it was funded, obviously, by the NIH, and, you know, it was a well-done trial. They ran two concurrent trials. So they basically ran a trial for women that had a uterus, and they ran a trial for those that were, had a hysterectomy. So the women, and those two groups were not exactly the same, so they can't be co-mingled. The women that had the hysterectomy tended to be more um, underserved and more minorities. In this group, they got unopposed um, estrogen and they enrolled almost 11,000 women. This trial was stopped on time at seven, it's almost seven years. Those that had a uterus, a bigger cohort, almost 17,000, were a lower risk group, okay? The AS, they, remember they didn't have the ASCVD score. <laughs> But if you look at the risk pool, that pool of patients was lower, okay? This group got both estrogen and progestin in order to protect the uterus from uterine cancer's risk of the unopposed estrogen. And this study was stopped early because of risk greater than the benefit. The average age in this trial was 63. The primary outcome was non-fatal MI, heart disease death, safety outcomes were breast cancer, and then they did this thing called a global index, looking at oh, how many fractures did you have, how many colon cancers, and they were trying to figure out, overall, was this kind of treatment beneficial to the woman? I mean, maybe she got less breast cancer, or maybe she got less fractures, maybe she died less of heart disease. And here's what the, rest, the results showed. So in the patients who um, got estrogen and progestin, the heart disease risk was elevated by 29%, so you can see that here. The stroke rate was elevated by 41%.
the venous thromboembolic disease risk was twofold, and this has actually been a very stable number for all treatment trials for women in heart disease. Um, total CVD was 22%. Fractures were actually down because estrogen improved the bone health and decreased fracture rate. Cancer was basically null. Death rate was null, but the global index was in the wrong favor of the hormones. And the trial was stopped, and all the press was like, hormones are not indicated for primary prevention. They're not indicated in secondary prevention after HERS. And there's some excess risk to take an estrogen and progesterone for women that have an intact uterus when it's prescribed in your 60s. That's really what the um, outcome data shows. If we look at the annualized um, heart disease risk by year, the risk was the highest in the first year for a woman that's been without hormone and then you give her hormone. And then the risk kind of was basically undulating and, and, and followed the, the placebo group pretty well. If you look at the, what is the excess event rate per event in this study, estrogen and progesterone, there were seven additional heart disease events. There were eight extra strokes. There were eight pulmonary emboli. There were eight invasive breast cancers. There were six less colorectal cancers. There were five less hip fractures. So the global index was, you know, not in favor of the woman by 19 excess events. And because of this data, it really halted the practice of women receiving hormones. I mean. And women, their doctors just like stopped them cold turkey. I mean, there was a lot of like turbulence in the medical field um, during this period. If you look at more in depth at the data, how women responded to hormone therapy was really, and what their risk group was like, really had a lot to do with how many years past menopause were they when they received the hormones. So for women within that 10 years of menopause, um, even with estrogen and progesterone in this study, and I know it's a subgroup analysis, and I'm, I'm leery of saying anything about that, but in that group, they appeared to be safer from hormone um, exposure than women who were over 10 years after menopause. So clearly, you would never treat some woman 10 years post-menopause with hormones, but I would make the observation to you, we wouldn't treat that woman with hormones really anyway, because really the predominant reason to treat a woman is for symptoms. And symptoms occur early and they abate over time. So it kind of nullifies why we really treat a woman, but at this time in the period of you know, medical knowledge, we really thought estrogen or progesterone would be beneficial long-term for a woman. And we've clearly demonstrated, especially in older women, and for those post-10 years after menopause, hormone treatment is actually adversely affecting their health. But it took, you saw how big the numbers were in the trial, it took thousands of women in a trial followed for four years before that data became obvious, okay? I'm making the case for the men. Okay, so if you looked at the women-only arm, actually it was a much better, which suggests that the progestin added to the estrogen added a lot of the risk. So overall, heart disease risk was null in women that had no uterus with treatment with just estrogen alone. But still you see this excess risk of stroke with estrogen alone, excess risk of PE, in this case, there was an excess risk of, um, um, oh, venous thromboembolism, and overall hip fractures and um, overall fractures were down. If you look at it again, timing of when you give the hormone to the women without, an, without a uterus, again, you see this gradient of risk by age and by time from onset from menopause. Not as robust as the one the, the um, graph with the estrogen plus progesterone, but still an adverse risk as women grow older. And if you look at the number of events, you can see them, and this is just for inclusion in your syllabus. Um, it just shows you across the board elevated risk in women, again, um, markedly changed by their timing from menopause. Again, I'm making the big case about hormones 
in all the trials showed an elevated risk of stroke. Okay? Um, if estrogen alone, estrogen, progestin, and I, I think the takeaway message is that hormones for women are not good long, long term for the prevention or for the elevation of your health. Um, certainly there's excess risk from all the data that we've seen, even the observational trials and from primary and secondary prevention randomized control data that shows that yes, indeed, hormones increase your risk of stroke and your risk of venous thromboembolic disease. Um, and because of those things, I warn women every time I see them about the risk of the hormone and you have to look at the risk benefit ratio. Certainly this data is helpful in reassuring that for women that are going through menopause that have the most symptoms, taking hormones early um, may be safe. And here's some more data, okay, here's some more data about the stroke risk. Um, and so basically, I think we've summarized the WHI in saying that there's elevated risk of breast cancer for those that received the progestin compound. There was definitely an increased risk of heart disease, particularly in the first year. There's elevated risk of stroke, and the global risk was increased. For those that take estrogen only, it may be safer than those that take estrogen and progesterone, but still there's an increased risk of stroke. Um, and certainly no long-term benefit in these women. So basically, um, hormones are contraindicated in women with established disease for sure, okay? Hormones should not be initiated for primary heart disease prevention. This is no statin drug. And estrogen increases clearly the risk of stroke and venous thrombosis. And hormones should be considered early after menopause for the relief of vasomotor symptoms. And honestly, the rule kind of in the community is, Hormones should be taken at the smallest dose for the shortest amount of time. And then encourage other kind of lifestyle modifications to help with that. Now, this brings up one important point about the timing hypothesis. So I know that people in the field thought that, and you can tell I kind of share that feeling that maybe those trials weren't really um, the the treatment randomized trials weren't really a, um, an ex um, didn't really capture what we really do in the real world by treating women with hormones when they go through menopause. The problem now is that we have two major treatment trials of women that showed harm, right? Which means that nobody's really going to be too eager to fund a trial of women for treatment effect of hormones even if you wanted to try it in people that are going through menopause. Does that make sense? An earlier treatment trial might have given us a different outcome. And the timing hypothesis kind of addresses this. The question is whether estrogen, when given to a woman, as she goes through menopause, someone that has not withdrawn from estrogen, may actually slow the development of atherosclerosis by improving lipids and endothelial function, um, and the question is, can you prevent that? And so there's this whole thought that the observational and the clinical trials were at a, um, a, a were disparate populations, where the clinical trials were in older women, the observational trials were in younger women, menopausal symptoms were excluded in the treatment trial, but those were the people that were included in the observational trials. And then the timing since menopause obviously is much shorter in a treatment trial of women with menopausal symptoms. And then the whole question about the treatment um, of people postmenopausal with symptoms and the observational trials, they got estrogen for, I mean, I still see patients that just like refuse to come off their estrogen and they may be like close to 80 and you're like, really? I'm really not thinking it's benefiting you anymore, you know? And they're very hesitant to change their dose because they've done, for those that have done well, they don't want to come off. They think it's the, the fountain of youth. Um, and then this whole question about obesity. So if you look at those relative risks, again, you can see that in young women that get hormone, either estrogen or progesterone, if they get it young and stay on it, they did well. But there may be some bias in these groups that those young, healthy people that were really interested in their well-being were healthier enough to be exercising. You understand there may be some intrinsic bias in these observational studies. These were healthier 
vainer, eager beaver women that were keeping their body weight down and less diabetes and, and making themselves healthier in other ways, which could help to explain some of these findings. The WHI took those primary prevention women that were randomized to hormone, and when the study was halted, they got money, and they went out and had calcium scores on over a thousand patients that were enrolled in the clinical trial, which I think is a really a very fine test, and I think some of you, I've, I've given a lecture here about calcium scoring, looking for plaque as a marker of who has coronary disease. So you might expect if somebody were to have more events later, they'd have more of a calcium score when they're younger. So they went back and they took, they didn't have a lot of money, so they, they, they wanted to look at that early group of women aged 50 to 59 who went through menopause um, recently and were randomized to WHI and were studied on the hormones for 7.4 years and they obtained calcium scores um, 1.3 years after the WHI initially stopped. The mean age at the time of the calcium score was almost 65. And why calcium score? Because it's a marker of how much plaque you have and it's an inflammatory kind of marker that you can get that's actually very um, stable between measurements. So it's like there's not a lot of error in the measurement. It's like the calcium goes into a plaque and it sparkles. So it sparkles under the x-ray so you can count the sparkles. And it's a marker, a pretty validated marker of um, elevated um, cardiac risk. It's a pretty cheap test in the community. It costs about $150. Most insurance won't pay, but it's, I love it. I love it. It helps me a lot. Um, and so you know who has plaque. And in this study, the women that got the estrogens um, alone actually had lower plaque, plaque um, mean scores and also had a significant p-value and, oops, I'm going the wrong way, had lower plaque um, numbers. So was some thought that this timing of when you give the hormone would maybe affect a surrogate marker for outcome. And most, and then I'm going to skip this one because this is kind of goes um, again, this shows that there's this aged variant variable on a gradient of risk in older versus younger women, and um, it really remains unanswered, quite honestly, because I think people are going to find it problematic to run a trial of the right magnitude to answer the question. But there is intrinsic data like mice models that estrogen itself inhibits progression of established lesions in the vasculature. Um, and we tried, I'll say, to look at, um, I'm going to go to this one important case, it's the ELITE trial, because it was a New England Journal article two years ago, um, where they, well, actually, it was earlier in this year, where they took 600 postmenopausal women with no coronary disease. And they treated them. This was mainly in California. So those people are kind of healthier. Um, they looked at group, two groups, women that had been through menopause within six years and women who were over 10 years from menopause. And they looked at their treatment outcomes um, after being on hormone therapy. And they used both hormones, with uterus, without uterus, estrogen plus progesterone or estrogen alone. And they looked at carotid entomal thickness. And they did demonstrate that plaque growth was slower in the estrogen-treated group. Um, taking hormones within six years after menopause compared to the group that had been 10 years. So I think that it's very clear that if you've been f past menopause, very clearly there's excess risk. For women that are, I think that the corollary would maybe be for women that are at ASCVD score higher, that hormones would not be a good idea for those women, even for pr prevention of vasomotor symptoms. And so I kind of restrict the treatment or the counseling of women to treatment with hormones to those that are asymptomatic without heart disease who've been through, men of, you know, symptomatic through menopause within the last six years, really, because after that, you know, you've kind of already gone through it. Um, and then to restrict the hormones to that group that's in that low-risk category. 
because there are women out there that are suffering with vasomotor symptoms and honestly the best treatment really is hormone and if they're at low risk for heart disease I'm really kind of okay with letting them take it um, but again you don't know how long you need it until you withdraw the hormone and see how your symptoms are so I strongly advocate for taking the low dose is, that settles down your symptoms for the shortest amount of time and then to wean the dose off. Okay, so what about menopause? Okay, so there's this robust commercial advertisement to men about taking testosterone. And I mean, we are seeing young men, I mean like one of my fellows last night told me, see I'm the girl heart doctor so I have a different experience in my clinic than the male heart doctors, that one of my colleagues is seeing men that are like all on taking the testosterone and makes me very worried knowing what I know about women in heart disease and hormone replacement therapy. What we are increasing or are we increasing the risk in our male counterparts who may be at higher risk of disease anyway at similar age just because they're men, right? So what about menopause? Is it real? I mean, is it a manufactured disease to elevate the treatment of men to spend more money on testosterone products? Is it real? Is it worthy? Is it valuable? Is it safe? And the answer is we don't have much information. So I'm going to go through the data because there's going to be more data coming out so I'm preparing you for your reading of the literature in the next few years because people are interested in this more now than they have been. So what are the symptoms of menopause? Well, men will tell you they have low libido, they're fatigued, they're depressed, they may have loss of muscle mass, they may have more fat deposition, and the signs of men male menopause may be this loss of body hair, low, real androgen deficiency will cause low bone mineral density. It'll cause gynecomastia, it'll reduce the size of the testes, reduce muscle strength, and unfortunately it increases your fat mass. So what's the relationship between age and hormones in men? Well, guess what? Men, when they're young, make a lot of testosterone, okay, like huge numbers. Look at the numbers, 900 nanograms per deciliter. It's a huge number. And we all know men in their 20s act much differently than men in their 70s. And I have a college student. It's kind of scary to see this. Okay, so it declines over time. And this has been well um, demonstrated in multiple trials which came out in 2008 um, shows the relationship between age and hormone but it also shows the relationship between testosterone, free testosterone and LH and sex hormone binding globulin. So you get an idea what's the cause of why the testosterone declines in the male as he ages. So with age there's definitely a component to um, end organ testicular production failure, okay, because the LH goes up, okay, obvious, right, so it has to be that the end organ has stopped producing, very much like the end organ, the ovary in the woman stops producing um, hormone, clearly it's not like the woman where it stops almost 100% by the age of 55 in a woman, Clearly in men, they produce hormone much longer such that men can reproduce with children. I can make some funny, funny comments. I'm going to restrict my comments. About men having babies in their 70s. You know, they can still have produce children and heirs. But seriously, after age 70, testicular production of testosterone declines. So, age is important in this decline in testosterone. But the most important factor that makes testosterone decline is obesity, okay? And so they look at the same hormone levels, testosterone, free testosterone, LH, and sex hormone binding globulin, and they broke it down by BMI. So BMI less than 25 is pretty normal in America. Um, well, no, no, I shouldn't say normal. It should be normal. It's not common, right? So BMI 25 to 29, which is really kind of normal-ish, 
um, but it's called overweight, and those over 30 are called obese, although that is skewed by our population as well. And they looked at the testosterone levels, the LH levels, the free and the sex hormone binding globulin. And you can see that as the BMIs increase, there's no real step up in the luteinizing hormone level, which means that it's not just an end organ effect. It's not that obesity is suppressing the testes from making testosterone. Mm -hmm. It's because obesity interferes with the hypothalamus pituitary axis to make hormones. So it's interfering on top of age. As men grow older, they grow fatter. You see how this rolls in together? And it makes their testosterone levels drop even more. So, in fact, it turns out that obesity has a much greater effect on male production of testosterone much, much more than age. In that, if a man goes from a BMI, on average, from a BMI of 25 or less to over 25, he drops his testosterone concentration equivalent to 15 years of life. Okay? So one could make the argument that if you want to have robust testosterone levels, you need to stay skinny, okay? And that would help you the most. So how do we make the diagnosis? What's the real diagnosis of androgen deficiency? You have to have symptoms of, you know, menopause and a subnormal testosterone level collected in the morning between 8 and 10 a.m. Why? Because testosterone has a diurnal variation and it's standardized at the highest level in the morning. It's lowest at night. And treatment is strongly discouraged for because if you don't need it, if you don't really have really low testosterone levels, because this is, this is the funny part of the story. If you treat a man with testosterone, you're going to turn off his, you know, his hypothalamus to pituitary to testes axis so that you're going to suppress his innate ability to make testosterone, right? So you're going to turn off his ability to make it. And testosterone exogenously shrinks the testes size and makes less spermatogenesis. So you're going to make that man less manly by giving him hormone. And you're going to make him an addict to the hormone that you've given him, which isn't good, OK? I should have been a lawyer. OK, so what are the contraindications to testosterone? Well, you can't take it if you have known testic um, prostate cancer or breast cancer, obviously. Um, so you have to check the PSA and make sure it's less than 4. But in men that are at high risk of prostate cancer, like African-American men or men with first-degree relatives with prostate cancer, you don't want to give the hormone to any man with a PSA over 3. It turns out that testosterone treatment makes BPH symptoms much worse. It turns out there's a whole scale for BPH. And a BPH scale of over 19 is going to do really poorly with testosterone. It causes erythrocytosis, so you don't want to give it to a man with an, a hematocrit over 50 because hormones increase your risk of venous thromboembolism, right? And thick blood increases that risk as well, okay? You shouldn't give it to a man that has untreated sleep apnea, which is going to highly be prevalent in your population of these overweight older men because it makes sleep apnea worse. You shouldn't give it to untreated heart failure, people with known heart disease, or people with a prior history of DVT, PE. OK, that makes sense. Because it causes erythrocytosis, sleep apnea, there's a warning about DVT, there's a warning about heart disease, and these warnings have come out in the last two years. OK. So have we taken? the diagnosis of adult onset hypogonadism and made it a disorder or are we just letting these advertisers have a robust marketing strategy and make you feel like you have a disease which in fact you just got older and got fat 
So what about the prescriptions for testosterone? Well, guess what? We're talking about like a serious billion dollar baby, okay? It's now administered in five forms, patches, gels, injections, over three million prescriptions since 2012 for androgel alone. Testosterone boosting cells are like off the chart. I've got young men coming in asking for testosterone. And so like, I was like, somebody, I begged Dr. Willerson to do in his itinerary for the, like the male. And he was like, I don't know. I don't know if we want to get into that testosterone stuff. And I was like, you do, you really do because it's a problem. So I decided I'd tackle it. So I'm brave, I went for it. So there's a warning from 2003 where the National Institute of Aging noted that there was scant evidence to support the idea of male menopause caused by diminishing testosterone, especially in men as they reach their 30s. Um, this rapidly growing use of testosterone by men seeking to fend off the effects of aging had outpaced the scientific evidence. And so guess what? Some scientific studies have come. A meta-analysis, I'm gonna make this quick, a meta-analysis of 27 small, small, Remember how many people were in the women treatment or observational trials? They were thousands and thousands before we got the right answer. So what I'm suggesting to you that if this kind of risk is coming out in men in these small trials, what's it going to look like in a big randomized trial? Which is why the industry is not going to support a trial to show that their drug is harmful. You get it? So it's going to take like the NIH, maybe somebody in Europe to perform a trial. So there have been 27 trials of nearly 3,000 older men. There were 180 cardiovascular risks, and guess what? Testosterone had an odds ratio for increasing risk of 1.54, which really is just a 54% increase, which isn't that great, but they had a lot of um, healthier people because in this. They, when they looked at a retrospective cohort of 56,000 men, Relative risk for MI was 1.36 in the three months after starting testosterone. So it's a little bit like the estrogen story where the added risk was really at the beginning of the treatment because it makes the blood a little bit stickier. And if you already have plaques and you make your blood sticky, you might be more likely to form a thrombus. The risk was 2.2 fold higher in men when given testosterone over the age of 65. Compared to men less than 65, it was still two, okay? So that's an absolute risk of 6.25 or 10 cases per thousand patient years. And pre-treatment serum testosterones weren't even included in this because most of these men didn't have their serum testosterone checked. They just decided they needed testosterone. Does that make sense? They just went for it. They just went for it. So there is actually a, some studies looking at retrospective data in men. Here's the first one, 8,700 with low serum testosterone, less than 300, which is low. They were subsequently prescribed testosterone and they had a composite higher risk of all-cause mortality, MI, and stroke compared to men that never saw testosterone, hazard ratio 1.29. And these men were mostly older and 80% of these men had coronary disease. The authors of the study wanted to reflect that it was just a small absolute risk of heart disease, only 1.3% overall, which I would submit to you is actually a generous risk, okay? Remember, in cardiology trials, an absolute risk of 1% changed which, you know, TPA dose we use for decades, okay? Um, so. 1% can be a lot of uh, people if you're giving it to a lot of people out there. So the testosterone trials, this is important because this is new data. There was, they know that this is going to be a big problem for the public and they know it's going to cost a lot of money to answer the question. So the urologists got together and they decided that instead of funding some huge amount of 20,000, 30,000 men on testosterone, they'd look to see first whether or not testosterone treatment made any beneficial effect to mood, libido, muscle mass, and oh, by the way, we'll look at some heart disease risk. 
Because if we prove that it's not really making you feel better, nobody's really going to want to take it anyway. I think that's kind of reasonable. But that's what came out in the New England Journal, and there was an editorial this year. These are called the testosterone trials. Okay, it's like a series of seven double-blind randomized trials at 12 sites, but there's three main trials. One's a sexual function trial, one's a physical function trial, and one's a vitality trial. They were received, these patients were received testosterone gel or placebo for one year. They were all older than 65. They all had serum testosterone levels lower than 275 on two episodes. So they followed the rules. It took forever to enroll only 1.5% of those that were reviewed because it was so hard to find men that made these criteria, which is testosterone levels on two occasions lower than 275 with all the symptoms. They excluded prostate cancer, high-risk cardiac patients. Why'd they do that? Because they don't want to have people dying in their trial. So they excluded high-risk cardiac patients because they're worried. They, re they excluded severe depression, and what did they find? It increased sexual activity, sexual desire, and erectile function, but no difference between the groups on physical function or a six-minute walk, no benefit of vitality, and their rates of adverse events were basically the same between groups. So in conclusion, for women, Menopause increases your cardiac risk, it increases your risk of DVTPE, it clearly increases your risk of stroke, it increases CVD risk in patients with established disease, and it increases CVD risk in women over 60, over 10 years past menopause. It is safe in women with low clinical risk. It should be given only to symptomatic menopausal women in the smallest dose for the shortest possible time. And what do we know about menopause and androgen deficiency is that testosterone levels decrease with age and more importantly, they decrease with obesity. Androgen deficiency treatment with testosterone probably increases the risk of DVT, PE, probably increases the risk of heart disease and clearly increases the risk of prostate cancer. May have some beneficial effects on sexual function but the jury's out on physical function and overall vitality. So I'm going to leave it there and let you think about it. I think that the questions aren't fully resolved. Like, I personally, I'm 50, I'm worried about it, and I think there may be a role that hormone plays for women as they go through menopause that may actually be, may actually be preventative. I'm holding out hope. It may be true in men, but I'm actually very cautious about given people treatment for which there's unknown benefit and clearly unclear, previously ill-defined risks, especially to men that are at risk. So in my population, they're at risk, and those are the guys that have the most erectile dysfunction because they have heart disease. So one of my colleagues, he, he really needs to like, like not suggest that the testosterone is going to make these guys healthier because it may be making more heart disease. So. I'm going to leave you all with that. Perfect.